Um, and thank you all for joining me this morning. Um, I know that these are very challenging and difficult times, not only professionally, uh, but for personal lives, for your families. I just hope that uh, you're okay and your families are okay. And uh, we will spend the morning together to talk about um, some of the leadership challenges uh, during, uh, during a pandemic, uh, certainly during the COVID-19. Um, and um, I think one of the things that we've all experienced, certainly I have it in my, in my area of work, is that we have to deal with unprecedented challenges to our, our business. Um, it depends on which business you're in. Uh, certainly, uh, if you are in the hospital or healthcare business right now, the, the, the challenges are profound. Uh, we have to adjust, we have to deal with um, unprecedented operational challenges. Uh, those of you uh, that have now, uh, that are in um, uh, uh, sheltered in place or have a kind of do not leave home order, have had to learn to kind of collaborate uh, in new ways. Uh, uh, supply chains have to be changed. Um, financial challenges have to be dealt with. So there's a whole variety, a myriad, I would say, um, of challenges that are related to the specific business uh, that you're in. So, um, so what I want to focus on today is some uh, some general leadership challenges that we're that we that we are all dealing with, no matter what the specific business is that we're operating in. I'm going to start out. I'm going to share a couple of slides. I'm going to share my screen with you, and uh, we'll go from there. And then um, we'll open it up for some questions. So, um, I hope you can all see that fine. Uh, so, what we're doing, what we want to talk about is um, some specific aspects that make this crisis a unique leadership challenge. And um, I, I think there are three different ones, and we're going to talk about each one of them. The first one is a profound sense um, of lack of information and uncertainty. Um, as, you, as you well know, this is an unprecedented health challenge. Um, it operates differently in different countries. And uh, the information um, that we would wanna have, we don't have. We don't know how long this will last. We don't really know what the impact will be financially or on human health. And the information is changing very rapidly. So we have to deal in an environment of high uncertainty. Number two, there's a tremendous amount of fear and concern. So uh, this is not just a uh, a typical kind of crisis that we're dealing with or that affects us, not only our businesses, affects our families, it affects us personally. And that's not only for us, but that's for our team as well. <laughs> and then the third dimension, which is uh, typical for pandemics, um, for natural disasters, also for terrorist attacks, is that um, they change the way we're operating as a community. So uh, we're moving in this particular case from what I would call business challenges as usual or business challenges that focus exclusively on the business side towards a community orientation. And that has specific consequences for how we want to act as leaders. So I'm going to go through each one of them um, in turn. Uh, the first one has to deal with the lack of, uh, of information and with a tremendous amount of uncertainty. So we're all used to in our day-to-day -day business to make sure that our decisions are the database, that we get the most relevant information, that we have great debates with our team, and then we make the decision based on the available information after careful consideration. And that option is not available uh, during the pandemic, uh, during COVID-19. And as I said before, the reason for that is we have to act quickly uh, without having appropriate information. And um, very often the information is not available and will not be available for many weeks. So um, the way you wanna think about this is that even in environments of tremendous uncertainty, uh, you can maintain the trust of your core constituencies, that's your own people, your customers, your suppliers, and any other business partners, even though you don't have the answer. So I think a misperception is very often that in order to be able to maintain trust um, with our core a constituency with our core stakeholders, we need to have answers, we need to have solutions. Well, that's great, of course, but that's not gonna be available. So this tool that I have for you here, it has been very effective in dealing with situations, crisis situations where there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty, yet our goal is to maintain trust. And trust is crucial in these situations because it allows us the room to maneuver and the ability to make decisions in an environment where we are trusted and where we can then um, make the types of decisions with, the, with our stakeholders, whether it's customers or own people, uh, in a way that is much more favorable. 
So what you have here are four dimensions. Each one of these uh, dimensions comes from the research on what maintains or increases trust uh, during um, crisis situations. And I'm gonna go through each one of them because each one of them has some subtleties and some potential pitfalls. So the first one is transparency. Transparency means that, um, that it, it does not the same thing as full disclosure, that this is very important. Rather, transparency starts with understanding clearly what is in the head, what are the concerns uh, that my audience, that my specific audience has. And these questions will be different from a customer or for an investor, for example. So you first need to start out with asking yourself, what are the relevant questions that you're dealing with? What is it that my audience wants to know? And then the question is, how do I address them in a way that people feel that their questions have been answered? So um, what are some techniques in order to do that? So number one is to be absolutely clear what is it that people want to know. Investors may be concerned um, about the return on their investments or whether their investment is at risk. Customers have completely other concerns. Your own people will have other concerns. A good way to think about this is to tell them what you know, to acknowledge what you don't know, and then there are sometimes cases where you know something and can share it. That's particularly true when there are privacy concerns. So for example, people may want to know um, who the people were that, that uh, tested COVID-19 positive um, in your organization, but you cannot disclose this because of privacy concerns. In the United States, for example, those types of things would be a HIPAA violation. So in those types of settings where you, where you have some information, but you can't disclose it for various reasons, it's important then that you provide a reason for why you can't disclose it. And that reason needs to resonate with people and needs to be easily understandable. So for example, it's preferable not to talk about some regulatory context in detail. And it's it, it, it better, much better to talk about that the privacy of your, uh, of your audience is of fundamental concern to you. So uh, a very important part here when you're dealing with transparency is that you're being understood. So it is very natural for us to talk in a language that makes sense to us, but that is not understood by our audience. Um, this is particularly when you're dealing with non-sophisticated audiences. So it's absolutely essential that A, you understand what it is that they want to know and then address those types of concerns in a language that they understand that resonates with them, not just what makes sense to you. So that's transparency. Number two is expertise. Expertise is an important factor of trust. Uh, if you want to hire an accountant or you want to hire a dentist, you want to have a good one. So a reputation for expertise is crucial. Um, businesses in the United States and in Europe, but it's not true across the world necessarily, usually have a high level of uh, expertise or high level of credibility with respect to their expertise. Importantly, those expectations go beyond the core competency or the brand of a company. So for example, if you're a retailer, let's say you were, you were target to pick a real example, uh, your brand is not about cybersecurity, but uh, when they had a data breach, uh, people still expected them to have high level of competence on that. So this is important is that you don't necessarily control the expectations that people have with respect to expertise. If there is a sense that you're lacking expertise, bringing in a third party is important and an easy way to fix this. Um, this is also true when there is a sense that uh, you're lacking expertise, even though you believe you have it. But if there's a widespread belief that there's certain levels of expertise that you do not have, bringing a third party in is useful. Now, in the case of COVID-19, because of its unprecedented um, nature, uh, the expectation that you know how to do this in all aspects is not there. So uh, I, would not, I would not worry too much about the fact, you know, did we anticipate this enough and so forth. There's some aspect to that, uh, but I think that people do understand that this is, this is a magnitude here that uh, nobody really could, full, could um, as a business, would be expected to be able to handle easily. Having said that, where you will be evaluated is the processes that you put in place now, how you respond to it, there is an overall sense that companies should be ready to deal with unforeseen challenges. So that's more where the current expertise challenges come from. Third factor is commitment. 
Commitment is about making sure that people believe that you will find a solution for them, even though you don't have the answer right now, that you're going to fix it, that you're going to make them whole down the line. The two main techniques in order to generate commitment are, number one, a process, which comes a little bit back to the expertise side. So communicate a process, um, set up a process, and then communicate it. Uh, so for example, you may have your board involved, or you may have um, a daily meeting with your management team, or you put together a task force, or something along those lines. It gives people a sense that you're on top of things. Communicate the process, even if you don't know the answer. Second piece uh, that is important commitment is to make things personal. Personal means that you want to show up in person. Uh, in, the, in the case of a crisis, people want to hear from the person in charge. They do not want to hear from a Stokes person. They want to hear from the leader who actually makes the operational decisions. So by making it personal, for example, by reaching out personally to customers or to your own people or to the public at large, you can make things uh, you can make things, um, you can generate a sense of commitment. Um, a good example of this, if you want to look at something, is the video reported by the Marriott CEO, which I think was an effective way to demonstrate personal commitment. The last piece is empathy. Uh, this is often overlooked because we are so tied up in operational questions. But in a crisis, especially a crisis of the magnitude that we're dealing with right now, people want to see that you can connect with them as a human being. So you need to connect with their challenges, with their difficulties, with their fear, with their specific difficulties that they're facing because lack of childcare, because they may have a relative who is ill. Very important <clears throat> that you bring out the personal side as well, that it is not just um, a relationship that is focused on the business interaction. So that's the trust radar. And as I said before, what the trust radar helps you to do is to maintain or even enhance the level of trust when you do not have the answers. Because maintaining a level of trust is extremely important as you move forward during a crisis of this magnitude. So that was about uncertainty. The next um, dimension is about fear. So uh, obviously, this is an environment with tremendous fear, uh, where people are afraid uh, for themselves uh, and for their loved ones. And um, again, we can understand um, what these drivers are, how these processes work, and then we can take, take some specific actions in order to deal with them. So uh, one thing that we know, we've known for, for many years, is that the, the way people perceive the risk of a particular situation is not necessarily commensurate with the objective probabilities or the objective risk. Depending on the characteristics of a situation, of a setting, uh, people may overestimate the risk, and if they overestimate the risk, that can lead to fear and panic, or they may underestimate the risk. If they underestimate the risk, they may engage in behavior uh, that, in, that is not safe or induces them or um, may lead to bad outcomes. Um, these characteristics have nothing to do with the statistical probabilities. They are, they are characteristics of the situation, and depending on what they're like, fear goes up, or fear goes down, risk perception goes up, risk perception goes down. And there's a whole bunch of these factors. I've picked the five that are most relevant uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic. So you see here um, five factors. Novelty, that's a new situation. Dread, that means that, the, that the, the risk has very bad outcomes. In our case, of course, serious illness or death. That they're identifiable victims. The more identify them, the more personal victims the media reports on, fear goes up. Salience, which is a general measure for media coverage, again, very high during the pandemic, of course. And the last dimension is what I'm going to call powerlessness, that there's nothing you can do about it, that you're just being affected by it. <clears throat> this research originated in the context of nuclear power. Uh, that was one of the, that was the main drivers of that. And the reason for that is that the scientists were puzzled that people were so concerned uh, over the uh, peaceful use of uh, nuclear power, uh, even though the scientists were arguing that the risk is pretty small. Well, in the case of nuclear power, you had a new technology. The consequences were dreadful. There was a concern about identical victims. So all these factors played a role. And that meant that the subjective risk perception goes up 
So we know this for many different cases, how people think about cars, car accidents, for example. Uh, so people underestimate the risk of dying in a rollover, uh, but they overestimate, probabilistically speaking, the risk of being hit by a side impact collision. This is one of the reasons why SUVs are so popular because people are much more afraid of being hit from a car on the side than in a rollover, even though when you look at highway fatalities, uh, it's about 50-50. So how does this now play out in the case of COVID-19? Uh, it's novel, it's dreadful, the identifiable victims, and there is, a, there is tremendous amount of media coverage. There's not a lot you can do about this. Um, once the novelty value wears off a little bit, fears will get down a little bit. But at this point right now, uh, these four factors are pretty much fixed. Where you can do something is on the powerlessness side. And this is particularly true about your own people in your team, in your organization. So the more you can engage your people into, it could be volunteer effort into, you know, working together in order to solve a particular problem. The more people have a sense that they can do something about this, um, the more fear will go down. So think for opportunities where you can empower people, where you can unleash their desire to be part of something. Even if it's outside of the business, uh, it can help with creating more of a sense of power, of engagement, uh, of being able to do something about it. And that will not only have a direct positive impact, but, but uh, levels of fear will go down as well. A good example was recently in the UK, the National Health Service asked for uh, volunteers uh, they were asking for 200,000 volunteers and almost half a million people showed up. Again, you get the, you get the participation, um, but there's also a sense that, that, uh, that once we get engaged, once we do something, once we have a sense of empowerment, our level of fear goes down. So that's the second dimension, which is the emotional dimension. The third dimension uh, has to do with how our social norms <coughs> how our social norms are changing during a crisis. And by the, the crisis here, very specifically, pandemics, terrorist attacks, natural disasters. Um, this would not be true uh, by a typical business-related uh, crisis, if say um, a safety violation or something like that. So specifically to these types of crises that we're dealing with right now. So what's happened in this case is that our social norms are changing, or to be more precise, we're moving from one set of social norms to another one. So the typical way in which you're operating, uh, I'm going to call this exchange orientation. And exchange orientation, if you're in a business, means that you're providing goods and goods and services for compensation. And uh, you know those are the, the prices are driven by supply and demand, et cetera, et cetera. That's the typical way in which we operate uh, as a business during normal times. When we are in a case of a, of a crisis of this magnitude, pandemic, terrorist attack, natural disasters, we're shifting to what's called your community orientation. So how are these things different? Here's a somewhat um, uh, you know, kind of tongue in cheek example, but I think it makes the, makes the case very nicely. So assume you're going out to dinner with friends to a restaurant. You enjoy the dinner, a conversation is great, you enjoy the wine, and afterwards, you take out your credit card, you pay for it, and you leave a tip. Exchange orientation. The restaurant provided goods and services. You enjoyed it. You pay. You leave a tip. Very common. Now assume the same dinner takes place uh, in, a, in a friend's house. Same group of people. One of you is the one that's hosting. Sit together. You eat. You drink. The wine is nice. And now, at the end of the dinner, in order to show your appreciation, you leave a $20 tip on the table and say, that was really great. Well, that's, that's not appropriate, obviously. Why? Because when you are invited to a people's house, you are, you are now being governed by the rules of a community orientation. Uh, they're very different. You do not pay for your dinner. You don't leave a tip. Uh, and what you do instead is you bring a bottle of wine, maybe, or some flowers, or you invite people over the next time. Another example, a bake sale at a school. You don't just write a check. You, you bake a cake, and then you sell it. And the reason for that is, is because community orientations are not structured by market exchange. They are structured by a sense of we all, as people come together to benefit the community. Uh, so it's not driven by supply and demand, it's driven by needs 
by need and a sense of contributing to the common whole. So this is very important because it means that as you engage um, with the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis, you are now operating in a community orientation. And it's very easy to get things wrong. Example, it is perfectly fine for Starbucks to charge a police officer $3, $3 a bottle for a bottle of water. It's totally inappropriate, this is a real case, to do this after 9-11 when a police officer runs in in order to get a bottle of water for people that have been that have been victimized or have been affected by, uh, by the 9-11 terrorist attacks. So at that point, you gotta have to participate. You give it a free, you volunteer, that's community orientation. So this becomes relevant, particularly in the context of how to help. So in a community orientation, we have certain patterns for what we expect a good helper to do. So, um, the, so the Good Samaritan example, the Good Samaritan principle is just a, it's a reference to an example from uh, a story from the New Testament, uh, where, uh, you know, there's the Samaritaness of somebody who gets injured on the road, who has been victimized by crime, and he is both competent uh, and caring. That's the important piece. So the Samaritan, the good helper knows what to do, and he cares. That's the pattern, that's the paradigm of a good helper. Of, of, of how, we, how we think about, you know, how, how somebody who contributes to the community effectively. Uh, when you do this, when you engage in activities now as a business, it's important that you focus on that. Don't focus too much on your core competency, whether you have something to offer, so to speak, as a business. Uh, to give you, you know, again, a somewhat whimsical example, if you are a healthcare company, a beauty company right now, don't worry about giving people skin moisturizers. It's about water, supplies, help, and so forth. And this particular, of course, there are specific challenges that we have in the COVID-19 context. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because when we typically engage in corporate social responsibility activities, there it is important that there's some connection to our core business. But in a pandemic, natural disaster, community orientation, these are secondary concerns. And then the last thing I want to point out is do not forget about your people. Um, We've mentioned this a couple of times already, but this is extremely important to highlight that. Um, they want to be part of this. Uh, I've talked already about empowering them, helps them to reduce their own level of fear of anxiety. But there's another piece here that I think is, is really important. And um, I'd like to, again, have a little story on that that I think emphasizes that. Um, uh, this was Apollo, the movie Apollo 13, you can see it there. Uh, Apollo 13, if you recall, was a lunar mission that went wrong. And then the question was to bring the, uh, the astronauts uh, back safely. And, um, uh, and there was this critical moment when they were running out of oxygen. And uh, uh, the head of NASA walks into ground operations. And um, he is clearly in a state of panic. And he says, he expresses very clearly his sense of panic by stating, this is the worst moment in the history of this agency. And then the hero of the movie, which is uh, Ed, played by the actor Ed Harris, if you've seen the movie, he has kind of a white vest that he pulls, you know, whenever he, there's a critical moment. Ed Harris leans over uh, and says to the head of NASA, with all due respect, sir, this would be a proud, but proudest moment. So it's very important to get people out of the sense of fear and concern and to and to tell them that this is a moment that they can be proud of, that, that they will tell their grandchildren for how they, how they conducted themselves, how they conducted themselves as people, as a business, and as leaders. So this is a moment to shine. This is a moment to, to, to show everybody what you're all about. And the best example that I know of this <coughs> was uh, Winston Churchill's speeches. Uh, during the, you know, the first months uh, of the, uh, or the first years uh, of, the, uh, of the Second World War, right around the time when the German invasion started, uh, where again, he talked about this would, be our, this would be our proudest moment. And the important piece here as a leader is not to sugarcoat this, to be, but you want to be the follower. You want to be realistic. You want to tell people what the challenges are, but you also want to give them a sense of hope that they can get through this and that this is, an, this is what's something that they can do or the way they will handle themselves right now will build their legacy 
uh, as professionals, as leaders. And uh, the more you can emphasize this on the day-to-day -day side, the better because it will energize people, make them come together, it will reinforce their sense of community. And as we've seen before, it will enhance their level of trust and also reduce their fears. So let me um, give you one example. Uh, this is not in the COVID-19 case because we don't know enough about that yet. But what I would consider a gold standard of how a company has handled that. And you can see many of the different elements that we've talked about um, that we've talked about now in action. Uh, this was uh, Walmart in the context of a Hurricane Katrina. And if you recall, um, uh, everybody, people were cut off uh, from supplies. They needed water, they needed um, food, they needed shelter. And the federal government <coughs> was struggling to provide it to them. So what Walmart had done, it had, uh, it had anticipated the potential impact of Hurricane Katrina and decided to dedicate their ability as a business on logistics, uh, delivery, and supply chain in order to provide supplies. That's the community orientation. So, um, so very importantly, um, this came from the leader. This came directly from Lee Scott, the CEO at the time. And what Lee Scott told his people is, these are extraordinary times, and I expect extraordinary things from them, from you. Meaning, you will have to make decisions that you usually are not, that, you, that usually we do not ask you to do, and that's okay. And if you have to go beyond the boundaries of what's required of you at this time, do that. And, uh, and, uh, and people did. Um, there are famous examples of store managers that broke into um, their pharmacy in order to provide um, life-saving medications to diabetes patients. Um, and here's some other example. This is from a store manager. It broke my heart to see them like this. They were my kids' teachers. Some of them were my teachers. They were my kids' sports kids. They were my neighbors. Notice the, notice the uh, community language here. Then the truck driver. When I arrived, it sounded like somebody scored a touchdown in a football game. I could have sat there and shook hands all day. They were so happy to see me. Now, these are quotes by people that are on the front lines. It is not common for Walmart usually to have their, their frontline people to uh, you know, talk directly to the press. But Walmart made them available because it was their stories that were so powerful. And now put yourself in the shoes of the truck driver or the store manager. For the truck driver, this moment that he has right now will be the most important, the most meaningful moment of his professional career, of his working life. And that's, that's, what, that's what the leadership enabled, what it empowered here. And uh, the whole experience was so powerful for Walmart that it turned around uh, how they thought about their engagement, um, certainly with respect to sustainability practice and a whole variety of other aspects after they had been pounded uh, by activists with respect to their business practices. So at any rate, look for an opportunity where you can empower your people when you can, can come together as a business in a sense that this is a moment where we will be proud to talk our kids and our, our grandchildren about. And, you will, and, and, and that sense of empowerment will help you with trust, it will help you with fear, and it will help you with people pulling together uh, as a community in these difficult times. So I'm gonna pause now and uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then we're gonna open it up uh, for questions. Um, I just already saw that there's a couple coming in and uh, just gonna do that here and uh, we'll take it from there. So I think that the, um, when, you, when you're dealing with long duration, there are a couple of things that, that, are, that are important. Um, the first thing is, is that you are, you are clear about reinforcing um, the messages of coming together, how this affects you as a business, try to reinforce the values that you stand for as a company, um, and how these values can be actualized um, in, a, you know, in a crisis like that. Now, uh, it, is, it is absolutely essential and we talked about this, we touched on this in the context of the trust radar, is that you're not making predictions or announcements that you later have to pull back. So uh, for example, over-optimistic rosy scenarios. The temptation will be um, to give people comfort, which is good, 
But what you don't want to do is you don't want to provide a false level of security um, or a sense of providing them with, um, uh, uh, with predictions or projections. Then later you have to walk back. Uh, people react better if, you be, if you're very candid, if you tell them that's the situation as you see it, that there's a lot of uncertainty, that there are things you don't know, but once the information comes in, uh, that, you will, that you will follow up and you provide them updates. Uh, this is what I said before. You want to be realistic. You want to be factual. You want to be um, not pulling punches and not you know, sugarcoat things. But you also have to convey and portray um, a level of confidence that we will get through this. Um, so this tension, you know, on the one hand, a, a very clear communication and awareness of how serious the situation is and what it means personally for people, that's the empathy part, but then also um, a projecting a, set, a level of confidence and that we as a group can get through this together is essential. A, a good example of this, unfortunately, you're gonna have to speak German, but it's like, uh, it's, um, it's, it's quite effective, was uh, Chancellor Merkel's um, uh, a message to uh, the, German, the German nation, German population uh, about 10 days ago. Uh, exactly had exactly that. Very realistic, very clear about what the challenges are, making it personal to people, uh, but also a sense that, uh, of confidence of moving forward together. So maintaining that over a long time um, is critical, is essential, uh, but it's not easy. Yeah, so there, is a, there, are, there are many examples where uh, companies are not handling this very well. Uh, the most famous example probably is the, uh, it's an old example, but it's a, it's a classic, was the Exxon's reaction to the Exxon Valdez crisis. And um, uh, there they were, you know, they were dismissive. The CEO didn't want to talk, they didn't want to talk about it. Uh, there was a whole variety of different things that, uh, uh, that went wrong and it had, uh, it had long-term consequences uh, for how, certainly how far Exxon's uh, reputation has been affected. So this is an important piece, by the way. This is not our primary concern, uh, given how, you know, how serious the situation is, but it is something to keep in mind, is that how we're being perceived as leaders and as companies is largely shaped to how we conduct ourselves during these crises. Uh, and the reason for that is, is that um, when we have a situation like that, people pay attention. And uh, when they pay attention, they remember, and they may remember for a very long time. So the, the, another way to say this is that in addition to the operational challenges that you have, uh, you're, there's also a reputational aspect uh, where the lights are bright and everybody's looking, your own people, your customers, if you are large enough business, uh, the community of large, of how you're conducting yourself and that will shape your reputation, that can shape your reputation um, for, a, you know, for a very long time. Typical mistakes are one, people focus only on expertise. So if you recall on the, uh, on the um, uh, trust radar, you know, we had the transparency, uh, expertise, we had commitment uh, and we had empathy and people are so tied up in their operational aspects that they will only focus on the expertise side in part because also that's where they are, their comfort zone is. So one reason for why this tool is, is useful and why it's so simple and why I, frankly, why it's in a graphical context so that you remember it better, is for you to make sure that you hit all four. So uh, don't, don't just go for one, try to hit all four, unless there's a very good reason not to do that. Sometimes there can be reasons, there can be legal reasons, uh, for example, you know, on the transparency side or on the empathy side, but in most cases, those are not severe and there's always a way uh, to hit all four. So, Try to make sure, so your, another way to say this is your bias as a decision maker will be to fall back only on one or two, usually expertise. So you have to counter that. You have to make that, make that explicit, have to make that clear and make sure that you hit all four uh, as much as you can. Yes, so I think what you, what you have here is, so, so this, is a, this is a different aspect of what we're dealing with, but I think an important one, I think certainly something we're all dealing with. So I think the fundamental question, and it will depend from business to business, is um, 
you know, is this a new world? Are we dealing with, is this, a, is this something that would change the way we, we work and we live moving forward? Or is this a temporary disruption? And uh, I think this will, this will depend uh, from business to business. Um, I'll give you just a couple of examples of that. I think that, um, so in my, own, in my own area, I have been you know, provost of the University of Chicago for many years. And by the way, the provost is like the chief academic officer and I also oversee the budget. So I kind of manage the university on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, you know, like any many other universities, University of Chicago had to switch from in-person education to online education literally within a week uh, or within two weeks. Uh, you know, that's that's a that's a massive shift. I mean, you're fundamentally changing the way you're operating. Now, it's not it's not perfect. It's not the way it should be. Obviously, there are many things that are not there, uh, but it was something that I think was done reasonably well, quite well. In a short amount of time. Now the question is, you know, what does that mean now for the future of online education? How are we thinking about that? And is that is that is that going to accelerate that, or will it emphasize actually the value of being in person, of being together? The second example that I'm sure you all have seen is uh, you now have to work remotely. You have to uh, interact as teams and um, as teams through video Zoom or conference calls or whatever it is. Now that, again, it's something you may have done already, but it now forces you to, to work in a different way. <coughs> so more generally, these crisis situations also tend to be situations where you have to innovate under pressure. And it's a very important part that you learn those lessons and that you take, that, you, that you're aware of that. And uh, that it's not just about, you know, making sure you survive the next few weeks, but also uh, think about this as, a, as an experiment, as a test case. And are there aspects now that you can take forward um, when this crisis is behind us uh, to improve your business? So um, and here's, a, here's an example of how I, how I remember that. Um, so you may recall uh, during the uh, financial crisis, um, AIG almost went, almost went under. And... Uh, the CEO at the time, Ed Liddy, uh, who stepped in, who was a former CEO of Allstate, told me once that when he was managing the situation, he had in his coat pocket two, two yellow little cards. In the left side of the coat pocket, he had the 10 things that he needed to do to make sure that AIG is still in business tomorrow. Super urgent, right away, crisis management, uh, uh, you know, the crisis management in the purest sense of the word. In the other pocket, he had a card to write down the things that could help him make the business stronger once they get through that. So it's important that we keep, in some sense that, you know, metaphorically speaking, you have both of these cards in your pocket that you're not entirely overwhelmed all the time by the day to day, but you watch out for are there opportunities uh, that will help you to be more effective uh, as, uh, as this terrible crisis uh, comes to a close, comes to an end. Um, and you know what that is? Will depend on your business, but <coughs> it's a good idea to be mindful of that. Yes, so I think that this is connected to, um, to the NASA story that I was telling you about. I think it's natural, first of all, it's absolutely natural to have anxiety um, in this case for yourself and for, and for your people. And if you're in a leadership position, um, you don't only have to manage your own anxiety, you have to manage your, the anxiety of your team as well. So uh, I find it extremely useful. I give you a couple of just concrete tips of how you can deal with that. Uh, the first thing is related to what I said before. Look at this and saying, this is, this is a moment to shine. This will be my proudest moment as a leader. This is how, where I will write my legacy. This is something where I will look back with pride of how, of how I and my team have handled that and communicate this to your people. Uh, it, you, it's, it's really remarkable how people, uh, if this comes with conviction, 
it's remarkable how people respond to that because they want to step up. They want to be, the, the, you want to move from a victim orientation to a hero orientation. That's what you want to do. And you want to move from a sense where you're being just kind of like affected by that, where you're powerless and helpless to something where, yes, there's a challenge. Yes, 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 this is not what we wanted. Yes, this is a crisis, but we can be the hero. We can be the one that can actually make a positive, lasting positive contribution here. So that's number one. Number two, um, you know, these, 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 these questions, these feelings of anxiety will come up and there will be moments of panic. And it's, it's just like, you know, some mental techniques of boxing that, of thinking about trying to think about this only at certain times and, and, and literally of remedying yourself. You know, what I've just said before, that can be very helpful here. Now, I'm going to give you one more example of this that I've seen, uh, particular working with teams. Uh, this is very, this is very difficult for people, but it's very important that you're aware of that. So people have a very hard time, most people have a very hard time to deal with um, uncertainty over an extended period. Uh, this is painful for people, this is challenging. And so they wanna have answers. And then again, our tendency maybe is to bite answers even if we don't have them, you don't wanna go there. So in a team setting, uh, for example, there will be a tendency for people to want to go to, the, to those questions that have the biggest anxiety or that have the biggest uncertainty right away, even though at this point there may be no solutions. So uh, people may want to know, for example, hey, what happens if we lose, you know, if this is the financial impact, what do we do then three months from now? Because that's what's front and center of their mind. It's very important that you triage in a different way. So when you're sitting with your team, don't triage based on that, but triage on when you have to make the decision. Or to put it differently, operationally, <coughs> you wanna match your decision speed with what's required by the situation. Meaning, you wanna decide what has to be decided today, today, and you wanna decide what has to be decided a week from now, a week from now. Now, you still want to think about contingency plans, but you don't want to make decisions or even foreshadow decisions uh, if they don't have to make, have to be made now. So two reasons for that. Reason one is in a crisis, nothing's more precious than time. So don't waste it on things that don't have to be decided now. Secondly, there's an option value of information. So things will evolve over time and you will, you will have more information a week from now than you have now. So use that information <coughs> and make time your friend in that sense. You have more time to think about it and new information will come up. So something that in a particular things get very panicky and very hectic, focus, one important thing for the leader is to tell people to, to set the agenda. In other ways to say, we're, we're deciding on this now and the other things, we're going to postpone. And sometimes the most important decision that you can make in these settings is to decide what you're going to decide on. So uh, meaning, be very clear about what has to be decided now, what has to be decided in the future. And, uh, and that allows you to get more mental capacity to deal with the types of things that you're dealing with right now, more time to think about the other issues, and you have the value of information um, as the particular situation changes. You connect with them what they are, what they are sent, what, who they are, is that they can do, they can do great things that, you know, that, uh, that they have the capacity to get through this, uh, that they can work together as a team, that they have a good culture, that they have great values, that what they're doing is purposeful and meaningful, that they're ready for this. It's going to be tough. It's going to be challenging but that they're ready for this. So you don't want to, you can't give them answers. You can't give them a sense that everything will be fine or easy or anything like that. That's totally inappropriate. But what you can do is you can say, look, we've been through a lot together. We, we, we work together as a team. Um, we will work hard. We are talented and we can, we will get through this together. It will be hard. It will be challenging, but it will be one of the most, rewarding and proud moments of your professional career. That's what you want to emphasize. One bit of guidance. I think it's, a, so I think 
So be clear and be realistic about what the challenges are. That's one. Um, and uh, the second piece is, is understand that psychologically, what's in people's heads will be different from the typical business practices that you're from the day-to-day -day business that you're typically dealing with. Be aware of that, accept that, understand that, and then act accordingly. Um, what I would, what I would emphasize on this is that people, if they are led appropriately, can do amazing things. They, that's, you see this again and again, but they have to be led appropriately. So they have to be led with candor, with authenticity, uh, with a sense that, that demonstrates that you are a person, that you are also a human being, but you have to have a sense of steadiness and firmness uh, and purpose and clarity and consistency of communications that people are looking for. So uh, another way to say this is that these are, these are times when leadership really, really matters. Um, you know, you, I've given you a couple of, of um, approaches and uh, tools that help you to be more effective, but, but fundamentally, you got to step up. You know, there's just no way around that. You're going to have to step up and you're going to have to step up not only intellectually, not only cognitively, but with your whole person. And, uh, and that requires, you know, a sense of um, what's going on in other people's mind a sense of empathy, a sense of connection, um, and a sense of confidence that the, the more you can portray it, the more effective uh, it will be in this context. Well, I think that, uh, you know, what there is, I think what, it, what, what you had was a couple of pieces here. Number one is, I think it's clear that our public health infrastructure is not what it needed to be. Um, you know, I was, um, uh, I was in Singapore recently, actually at the beginning uh, of the of the COVID nineteen crisis, and you know just just the the you know the ability there to step up uh, very quickly, uh, you know just in terms of like readiness for that, it's just they just we just haven't seen that here. Um, clearly, it, when it comes to supplies, um, critical infrastructure, public health infrastructure. Uh, so when you look back, were we prepared for that sufficiently? The answer is no. I think that's, I don't think that's, uh, uh, that's any doubt about that. Um, I think that now, you know, things are, are finally uh, getting better. That's my sense. I think the sense of the severity of the situation is dawning on people more. Um, I think you've seen some of the governors stepping up um, very decisively. Others are not. So uh, if you want to have, you know, we'll have a, we'll have a great, a great um, distribution of leadership uh, performance and lack of performance when you just look at the governors of the 50 states. Um, and, you know, the people that were decisive and that were clear and that took, that took bold actions, um, uh, you know, there are, there are some of them, but they're not all of them. So I think there, there is a sense now is that this is, this is it's becoming clearer to people, um, you know, what, what's required, what's happening. What I'm hardened by and encouraged by is, the, is one, um, how the country is coming together um, uh, and, the in, and the tremendous innovative capacity that, this, that the United States has. Um, people are coming up with new ideas, new solutions. Um, I've heard people now, this is for my new employer Vanderbilt, where they're using 3D printers to try to reassemble a ventilator from scratch. I mean, there's a whole variety of different things that, uh, that where you see uh, the innovative capacity of the United States are from kicking in high gear, whether that's on testing or on, on treatments uh, or on just dealing, finding alternatives to uh, the lack of supplies. So I think that's, uh, that's promising. And um, um, you know, we have a, we have a, we are going to have a tough few weeks. I think everybody's clear about that. Um, I don't think the start originally was where it needed to be, but I think now um, it's, uh, I, I feel much more confident that, uh, that we're, we're making decisions that are, uh, that uh, as, a, <coughs> as a country are pointing in the right direction.
Uh, I think it depends a little bit on what your setting is, what your situation is. I think people, um, you know, you want to know about the broader context. I think that's an important part. Um, but, you know, people are very concerned about their immediate uh, situation. They're, you know, they're, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my work? What's going to happen to my family? They're dealing with, um, uh, with uh, tremendous challenges. Um, you know, those of you that um, have young kids at home now, uh, that's a whole other layer of you know, complexity that has to be managed and handled. And so I think what you want to make sure is the more empathetic you are, the better. So the more you connect with people's um, specific challenges and what it is that they're going through as people, the better. That doesn't mean you're not going to ask them to step up and do, like Lee Scott said, you know, these are extraordinary times and we expect extraordinary things from you. I think the answer to that is yes, we do. Um, but the more you can check in on them, you know, see how they're doing. Um, are you okay? Um, you know, anything I can do for you. The personal side is, is, is very important. And, you know, not all corporate cultures have that. Um, some do already anyway. Uh, but again, as we're moving into this community orientation, the more you can do on that, I think, the more effective. Okay, so Ali, I think we have time for one more, right? Well, the more, I mean, now you can see the value of a network, of a personal network too, where you have a trusted network of peers um, to get ideas, to get suggestions, to get, um, uh, you know, to get tips and tricks. But I think just as importantly is to check in with each other because, um, you know, I focused a lot on the demands on your people, but obviously this is a tremendously challenging uh, time for you as, people, as, as leaders as well. And so just to kind of have the ability to talk to somebody who is in a similar situation um, and, you know, and like, a, you know, vent a little bit and, you know, get a little bit of a peer to peer conversation going uh, is very important. So, you know, whether that's these are other alums or whether these are, you know, former colleagues or, uh, or, or anything that is um, a, you know, your personal network, which I think is, you know, just comes in uh, enormously valuable to you. It would provide a lot of value right now. And so the, I think that's, that's one example of how you want to, of how you want to think about that. There are, you know, obviously many other resources out there um, of how to handle this or that situations. Um, you know, what I would, what I provide, what I try to provide for you are things today that while they're grounded in research um, that are easy to remember. So I think one challenge with these situations is, it's like, you know, what can I really, what can I really apply? And there are no more than three to four, I think, different rules or at, at, at tools or techniques that, um, that, 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 that really become, that you really can, I think, consistency apply. So many of these things you're doing already when you're leading your teams. As I said before, there are some aspects here that you want to modify, you want to shade. And then I think, you know, the characteristics of this, uh, of the pandemic, um, the lack of information, lack of trust, the emotional aspect and the community orientation. If you keep these things front and center, um, we should, you know, it will help you to be more to get through these uh, difficult times. And in a way where you come back and you feel your team uh, feel uh, that this was your proudest moment.